Oh, hello. Sorry about that. Uh, my browser crashed. <laughs> Yep. Um, so we're actually uh, like live and getting started here uh, soon, or soon, I think. Okay, perfect. Welcome to the session survival guide black swan events so we have jake here who's a senior reliability engineer at blameless and emily here who's a content writer at blameless so we'll get started with the recorded talk but we will be here to interact with you and answer any questions that you have okay here we go on Black Swan Events, a survival guide to Black Swan Events. I'm Emily Arna, the head content writer at Blameless, and I'm joined with uh, Jake. Hi, I'm Jake England. I am a senior SRE at Blameless. We're really excited here to uh, talk to you about how to handle these Black Swan Events. So we've got a five point agenda. Um, first, we're going to scare you a little bit with the idea that a meteor is coming bearing down on your headquarters. Then we'll talk a little bit about backup systems. What does it mean to really know your backups? How do you test the things you don't want to test? Uh, how do you look at incidents from a big picture perspective? And as a final solution for uh, dealing with uh, crises like a meteor coming, um, we're going to look at the idea of going beyond in-house. All right, so a meteor is hurtling towards your headquarters. What do you do? Well, uh, realistically, you might do things like panic. Uh, you might um, start getting in touch with your loved ones and uh, you know, letting them know how you feel. Uh, you might uh, figure out your pets and spend your moments with them. Uh, might start looking for some shelter uh, to try to uh, hold out this incident. Um, you know, things more uh, you know, related to survival than necessarily possibly keeping things running at work right now. Uh, so with that in mind, um, it's scope out, what are the things that we could do that we could have to handle uh, where this does strike the balance, where we have something at work that we actually do want to have, um, but or even to the extent of having something that extreme, what would it look like for the people who are sticking around and trying to make this work? So it really is about having imagination. Yeah, it's not about, you know, a meteor isn't really going to hit your headquarters. And if it did, you, I don't think any of this would be front of mind. But uh, imagining you are dealing with this problem as efficiently as possible and looking at what that solution looks like, it can be rewarding. So what, what are we really saying then when we say a meteor hits your headquarters, if we're not literally talking about an actual asteroid flying through space? Uh, we could mean a massive power outage. Let's say there's some bizarre electromagnetic pulse that takes out the entire Western half of the continent. We could mean something like uh, an admin on your, your service has their account compromised and suddenly there's a malicious actor with the credentials to do anything they want. And most importantly, it could just be something you can't even imagine, some scenario that you couldn't begin to hypo uh, hypothesize. But as long as all of these aren't as bad as a meteor hitting your headquarters, then by imagining a meteor hitting your headquarters, you're going to be prepared for them. 
So what kinds of things can we look at when we're thinking about what goes into making a meteor? Um, one thing can be, uh, don't contact anyone who's at headquarters. Um, if, you're some, if you're working someplace that is not centrally located, that you have any satellite offices, um, can one of those satellite offices take over uh, in the event of an emergency? Or if it, it's an event where that satellite office is actually the primary responsibility for that thing, can you simulate it something where they're the ones that are taken down? Really trying to have some failback away from anybody in whatever that source is, trying to have something a little more dramatic than just this one person is available. Um, what's something else we might want to look at? Um, what resources are there? This could be things like, um, you know, not only the people that are there, that uh, kind of institutional knowledge, but things like security keys, and that can be both digital and physical security keys. This could be a safe that has that security key in it. Um, that security key in that safe could have the passcode to that safe that without the external data source, you now have no way to get into. Um, then you might have to look into, do you have a physical override? Do you have to find a locksmith at that point? Do you have to find someone with an acetylene torch at that point? Um, that, you know, how dramatic does it need to get depending on exactly where your assumptions are uh, conflicting? Um, something else we might need to think about. Uh, you know, less people are available. Uh, along with that is that also physical demands in terms of if you're somebody that needs, or if you're in a situation where you need fuel as much as data, as much as manpower, all of these things can be reduced. And that's something that you need uh, to be aware of. And that in practicing this, these events, you can simulate even just by being able to say, we have half of whatever we would normally have for whatever this is. Users that are able to be connected to something, um, you know, kilobits per second for whatever this particular data connection is. Um, you know, especially if you're working and things that are in extreme environments and under uh, you know very constrained conditions. Um, so once you've done this and you've started thinking of all these different ideas of what kinds of things may cause conflicts, where can these constraints be? Start writing down. Make a log of every time that this is causing an issue. Know what these problems look like because this is the first step to being able to resolve it. Because it's better to resolve something before an incident has occurred than trying to reconcile these issues while an inc you know while a fire is happening right now that may not be the best time to try to resolve the kind this kind of logistical problem that you could handle now um also uh along with trying to expand things this is a great time to look at improvisation and recording what kind of clever solutions or what kind of just solutions that people come up with in the moment not only is it, do you look at what the issues are you look at how did people respond to it? If they didn't have everything that was available in their toolkit normally, how did they try to improvise? What kind of compromises did they make? Did they make the right compromises in that point? Um, and is that something that is discernible in the moment? It's kind of this idea of being in the tunnel and analyzing what, uh, what things actually look like to experienced people solving a problem without all the information, without the benefit of hindsight. And that answer can look very different versus when you're actually planning the test where you have this kind of foresight into what things might look like. And when you're analyzing the results of the test later where you have the benefit of hindsight and hindsight shapes a lot more policy than you might be uh, uh, you know, aware of. Um, then with this awareness of everything in mind, that's where you can start to make and adjust a plan to make that plan uh, ac acceptable, to make it uh, practical, uh, so that in the event that you have any degree of failure between normal operations and a meteor, that you have these levels of backups that you can go through and levels of acceptable tolerance and failure that you can handle. And that's one of the things that helps uh, improve resilience and really helps to uh, foster uh, to translate an, our organization from we've been reliable to we're able to be resilient, we're able to handle unforeseen is, uh, issues. Uh, so yes, with that entire concept on a meteor. <laughs> so uh, with your meteor, as Jake was saying, it, it often comes down to kind of like backup systems, having a plan B, a plan C, um, having something else to check if the main thing is unavailable. Uh, and we really want to drill into this idea, though. What is a backup plan? You might have a backup plan, but is it anything more than a plan? And uh, we have this quote here. If you haven't tested your backup plan, you don't have a backup plan. Um, you might say, oh, it's easy. We'll just switch over to like the B system. We'll switch over to the testing environment from the production environment if something goes horribly wrong. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of questions you can ask about that scenario. Uh, so we have uh, a little quiz here to better know a backup plan. 
Um, so if you had to switch to your backup right now, how long would it take? Uh, who would need to be involved? Um, are there specific people that have specific uh, domain knowledge? Um, or is this stuff actually very disseminated? What tools would you need? And, and what would you do if you didn't have access to those tools? Like in general, what could go wrong that would make the switch to the backup uh, not as smooth as you might imagine? So if you know the answers to these questions, that's great. You're, you're ahead of the curve. Um, but do you really know the answers or have you just kind of theorized, oh, it'll probably take a couple hours. Oh, I, I guess we'd need to have operations involved. Only once you've tested, only once you've actually made the switch and seen all the things that crop up um, outside of the imagination, that's the only time that you can really say, yes, we have a backup system. And so in making sure that you have a backup system that is actually going to perform in the event of failure, in the event of these different modes of failure that are possible. You can't just test what you want to test. You can't just test what makes you feel good, what you already know the answers to. Um, that being resilient comes from dealing with unknown unknowns, things that you haven't anticipated um, and that uh, other people may have been able to anticipate. You know, it's not that they're necessarily inconceivable. It's just something that your organization and that you as a person in that organization may not be aware of um, as a way that something could go wrong. And as somebody responsible for developing the policies uh, and the procedures that can be used in the event of any sort of um, failure, emergency, need to switch to backup kind of situation, um, really having a robust testing plan where you're you know, testing all the known failure modes and making sure that those aren't degrading over time as your system changes because your system is probably changing over time. So you wanna make sure that the things that you know shouldn't be failing, shouldn't uh, the things that you know shouldn't be failing continue to not fail. But then along with that is making sure that the things that allow you to recover from unforeseen failures, such as your data backups actually work. And there's a big difference between, oh yeah, we're writing that data out onto tape somewhere and actually knowing that we can restore that data to something usable. Um, and a great example of this is having a staging cluster that's all just taken from a snapshot of production data that we have a daily snapshot shot of production data and our staging cluster every day or every time that we deploy it, we take yesterday's snapshot and we just apply that on top of it. That would be a way to know every day our backups have useful data. We can see it in our staging cluster. And that's a big step up from it's just on tape off somewhere. And in the event of crisis, we may have it there. But do you really want to figure out how to get the data off of those tapes? Um, during an emergency? And do you really want to know, or do you really want to find out that the data on that tape is actually useless because you don't have everything you need, or you haven't written it correctly, or it's something you missed because you never tried to use it before now? Is an emergency really the time, you know, is a meteor hurling down on your headquarters really the time for you to be, to, to be discovering, oh, this doesn't have everything we need? That's not a resilient practice. So you have to get creative and you have to get uncomfortable and you have to look at the things that can be really, uh, you know, different uh, and or unexpected. Uh, so Jake mentioned two terms that we really like working with here. Uh, first is the idea of robustness. And this is preparing for everything that you already know could be a problem. And I liken this to building up strong walls that can withstand, you know, storms and wind and rain. Um, but there's some things that fall outside the scope of like regular weather. So imagine you're dealing with nuclear waste. <laughs> um, you don't know everything that could cause a problem for nuclear waste in the uh, hundreds of years um, that it's going to be around for. Um, and even if you don't know everything that can go wrong, you can still prepare. This is where uh, the real, real issues are lurking. You know, like we said, the idea of an employee that becomes malicious where their account gets compromised. Um, and this is what we call resilience, preparing for what you hope couldn't be a problem for what maybe you can't even imagine being a problem, um, but you can still prepare for it. Uh, and generally we find tech companies are good at being robust. They, they're good at kind of testing what they're prepared for, testing what they want to see, but not as good at being resilient of, of coming up with these nightmare scenarios and still having an answer. So- awesome. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so as, as we're talking, kind of in, having this contrast between uh, robustness and resilience, and uh, one of the examples that came up in terms of something going wrong um, or something that's unexpected is this notion of um, a, mal a malicious employee. Um, a great story that I have from this that I think talks about how incidents aren't just about something going wrong. They're about everything. They're about the everything around that um, is that um, I worked at a company that had um, an internal penetration testing team. Their entire job was to just go around inside the company and see what they could break into. It was one of our security measures to just make sure that, you know, pe people were practicing good uh, security hygiene. And in the event that they were able to get access, um, this Penetra uh, this penetration testing team operated kind of outside, you know, none of the teams were aware that they were being pen tested at any given time. Um, and these teams had some valuable and important contracts and some very, uh, you know, detail laden contracts, uh, very parameterized contracts on how things are supposed to be handled, who has access to information, how that information is handled, um, what the audit trails look like, things like that, and that they will not deviate from this. So this internal penetration testing team manages to get access to an account under some um, with uh, yeah, under a team that has a contract very much like that. Um, and rather than just saying, okay, we got access, we're done, or at least, you know, this is something that's gone wrong, the pen testing team decided to pull just what can we access in here? Let's poke around and see how much can we get into? And the answer to that was a lot, um, way more than that contract had allowed them to get into at that point, which then yielded a kind of incident within the incident as well, is it wasn't just the fact that we had managed that our internal pen testing team had managed to compromise an account, and they managed to do this using only a single in-office Ethernet point, uh, no other, uh, no Wi-Fi access, no anything else. Like just that was the one uh, uh, kind of consideration and uh, compromise that they had there. Um, so with that amount of access that they were able to pull all this information, and even though they are internal to the company, they were not someone specified on that list as part of that contract, which then yielded its own kind of special thing. So even in the resilience testing process that we went through, we ended up having an actual resiliency exercise as well, because we weren't aware that this was a failure mode that we could even have, is our left hand not knowing what our right hand is doing. So when testing these things, you have to also be prepared for the fact that you may find out something you didn't want to know, and your simulated drill may turn into an active drill, depending on exactly how resilient your system is or not resilient your system is. So the, the image that comes to mind, I think, probably in a lot of people's minds, as uh, Jake was describing that story is, a bunch of dominoes. <laughs> you start maybe with one little incident that either happens or you're simulating it and quickly things can get out of control. So here's a real simple example. There's just a little typo in the code and maybe that causes a little server outage. Oops, the server went down. Ah, look, uh, someone forgot a semicolon. <laughs> Let's uh, quickly pull that back and redeploy. But when the incident uh, really starts spiraling out of control is when you start thinking of all the other causes um, that this could have. Like imagine the engineers that are stressed out by the fact that they suddenly had to do a rollout, um, they had to redeploy code, they had to figure out where this bug was. Um, and then when they're restoring servers, because they're so stressed out by this, there's an error that's made. And that in turn causes a much larger server outage which in turn causes some real dissatisfied company customers. And, and that's, of course, the state you never, ever want to get to, is where your users have um, really been impacted by something going wrong. So, you know, if you were going to simulate this, it might be easy to say, oh, in the situation where we accidentally deploy some bad code, we've got this five-minute fix that gets the servers back up and running. But is that really what's going to happen if that happens uh, in real life? Um, or is it going to cause these rippling effects? So when you're, uh, when you're trying to design what your response policy should look like, what your backup policy should look like, and what your incident response processes should look like, uh, outside of practicing them and figuring out what they look like, is that as you're imagining them, you really do want to think about things holistically, um, which means that you want to look at all the effects that they're going to have. You want to see, look at how they're going to affect your technical infrastructure. You want to uh, analyze how they're going to affect um, your the emotional and uh, social uh, 
you know, the reservoirs of your uh, engineers. You want to also look at how it's going to affect the uh, social and reputational impact of your company um, to have an incident like this. A great reminder on these ones are things like security incidents. You really don't get a chance to undo those is that once the cat's out of the bag on that, that's it. It's not like an outage where we were down for eight hours. You want to look at uh, the kind of uh, social impact that uh, your uh that these failures can have, though, not only to your customers, but to your um, uh, to the greater society as a whole, whether or not they're even customers as well, is that depending on the kind of thing that you're doing and the kind of impact that an incident at your company can have or in your organization can have. Um, and you also want to think very laterally about these as well. Um, you know, you want to think about abstract ways that this these incidents can trigger other issues. That it's not just about what this one thing can do and the other issues that can come out of that. And sometimes these are very interconnected because as you start thinking about what are these other impacts that they could have, those may be incident worthy in their own too, is that those may have their own problems and their own fallout um, as you're dealing with things from a marketing perspective and a technical perspective and possibly a legal perspective as well, um, depending on exactly what the incident is and what the failure is that you're dealing with, um, that these problems can get as complex as your imagination, really. Um, and thinking about how those things can uh, can interconnect is all about this idea of, you know, what is a meteor really? Is that it can be any kind of catastrophe that can have unintended consequences um, and things that will really test the fringes, the edges of your system um, and your response and uh, restore processes. Um, so how can you help prepare for this even further than where you may be right now? Um, well, it can help to think about where our, um, where your company is and where your organization is in terms of uh, maturity levels. Um, are you somebody that's using things um, a lot of like off the shelf tools, uh, third party, you know, is that like, are you somebody that is getting a lot of cloud space from like a Google or Amazon, Azure, or something like that? Um, things that uh, there's a great trade-off here uh, because you get the expertise and the bandwidth of large companies that know how to do this stuff very well. Um, and in exchange is that you're, you know, exchanging money for goods and services, uh, but then also uh, you lose some autonomy over that as well, because this is, of course, being administered and managed by something else. And that this kind of a shared fate, you know, is that if any one of these companies has an issue, has some sort of outage, it will affect not only them, uh, but all of their customers as well. You know, a great example of this one can be Cloudflare, um, that, you know, half the internet depends on Cloudflare. And so when they have an issue, we all notice it. Um, but, you know, there's always those smug companies off on the side um, that have done something beyond the basics or uh, in some sort of special situation um, that have something that doesn't necessarily fail with the common core or that they have something that is some sort of uh, specialized backup. Um, and that can fall into this category and it can fall into the next one as well. But customizing your implementations to do something more robust because a lot of off the shelf solutions really do give you like, here's enough to get you going, but that you can make this off the shelf solution a lot more smart for your particular implementation, your particular organization and understanding how to merge that and to make those tools smart for your company, um, you know, to custom build those things around what your needs are is that next step of maturity. It's not just about having it, it's about using it well. And then this is where we start to bridge that gap in terms of how much are you writing? Well, you've already written this kind of abstraction on top of it. Um, you may also find that now it's time to write the layer underneath that instead of using these third party tools, is that instead of using uh, Google Cloud or using Azure or using AWS, that maybe now it's time that we're going to be running our own servers somewhere. Maybe, you know, we've grown enough that now we have our own data center and we can do things at cost or something like that. And so it's time for you to start developing, building those tools um, that allow you to interface with that stuff. And at some level, that might be something where it's just like, oh, we have something where it's all abstracted out and we're just running Kubernetes at the end of the day kind of thing. Um, but, you know, determining exactly what level of autonomy and control you have is kind of this next step of maturity. Now we come around full circle to we now are in control of our fate and our destiny. Everything is managed by us. If we use open source solutions, you know, it's things where we have images and backups of whatever that stuff is. Um, but what if some core part of our process does break and we as a unit are no longer able to function um, or to depend on ourselves for something like our certificates get compromised for some reason um, or that literally everything goes down because our um, name servers ended up being pointing to the wrong IP and we can't get it fixed or something like that. Um, and that happens to control all the physical access for our building as well. Um, that 
this comes into a very challenging divide because doing something well enough to be able to handle it as a backup in this case versus what very, very well established companies can do is a challenge, but you can still run into this case where having external dependencies, having third party tools available for your backups can provide some value. One example of this is for your tape backups to not be in the same cloud provider as your actual running production. For example, if you're running in AWS, having your actual stored like tape backups or you know whatever data uh, snapshots you may do, you may have some of that in AWS, but saving a copy to Google Cloud may be a prudent measure for you, depending on how important that data is, how much it costs for you to save it somewhere else, and how prepared you want to be as you're chasing chasing that fifth nine this is something that you may need to think about is that uh, with a five nines of reliability at this point is saying that you might have five minutes of downtime uh in a year um and i think most of us tend to have a little more than that or you know depending on where uh, you work um and exactly what kind of services you're providing but uh that depending on what you want for that data availability and uh, robustness in terms of like we can lose it in any of these different situations um, and be able to restore from it that if you know that hey even if that data is stored off in tape in cold storage um, in a third party cloud provider that we can restore it from there and even if a meteor directly hits our headquarters and our data center that we can still come back from that um, maybe something that is just fun to have almost as a feather in your cap at that point if it's not actually providing what might even seem like a you know, reasonable amount of robustness or resilience in that point, um, just knowing that your company is capable of that, um, or the organization is capable of handling something like that, um, you get all the shared benefits along the way of less absurd situations that you can handle um, with greater adeptness because you can, you know, you've considered these absurd situations. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's uh, it really drives home the fact that you, you can't imagine the scope of incidents, you can't imagine the weird things that might happen. And the more in-house stuff you have, um, it almost opens you up to even greater vulnerabilities. Like let's say instead of using a third-party integration tool, you have an in-house tool. Well, you know, that's great because now you're fully in control of it. If something goes wrong, um, assumedly you might be able to, to deal with it quite quickly. Um, but having that third-party option alongside it uh, really gives you just that extra layer um, for these situations that you can't imagine. Like maybe you can't think, why would I need to have access to this third-party backup tool? But that's kind of the point. You can't think of why, but it could still happen. Um, Absolutely. And um, also along with uh, custom tools and using for, uh, more in-house stuff versus third-party stuff as well, um, another thing that can come up is usage and user base. There are so many in-house tools, things that are kind of home-ruled, that their security is through obscurity, that because mm. this is somebody doing something special, that... It's safe because nobody can decode our system except for when somebody can versus when you have these very public, you know, millions of users um, tools that then you get the, you know, these are things that are constantly people are trying to break or break into or compromise one way or another. And so they get the benefit of that security, uh, those security advantages and that security knowledge as well. Um, and so, you, you know, they don't get that excuse of security through obscurity. So it actually tends to be a very, you know, a hardened system as well. And so that's another trade off to consider in these situations as well is that like, if you're rolling something that's only being used internally, you necessarily are having fewer people test and use it. Um, and therefore, the exposure surface does change is that yes, it may be fewer people that are able to uh, even be aware that this is a thing to exploit. But the people that are aware of it may be able to use it very easily to that extent. So yeah, in conclusion, um... As we were just saying, it's, it's, it's hard to know. There, there's pros and cons of every solution. And it's easy to say, oh, just have this and this and prepare for this. Um, but at the end of the day, you're probably just not going to be as ready as you think you are. And this is kind of a, a recursive, endless rule that <laughs> no matter how much you prepare, you're not going to be ready as, as you think you are. Um, and that's really why we wanted to drive home this idea of, of preparing for the things uh, you can't imagine preparing for the situations that you can't articulate to yourself. Um, so you can improve. Uh, you can be ready for for things that you don't think you're ready for. <laughs> uh, as paradoxical as that seems, if you use these sorts of methods, you can be ready for a meteor. And if you're ready for a meteor, we think you're pretty much ready for everything. So thanks so much for uh, attending our talk. It's Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you were able to learn something.
that was great. So I think uh, we have a couple of questions. So I'm showing the first one. Uh, I think in this case, um, I actually would like to redirect this one to Slack um, for a little bit more of a thoughtful response because it's a great question. Um, but the it, they can get a little bit into the details there. Uh, that you know, I provided like one example of kind of like doing things at the abstract of like tape level stuff. Um, but for uh, any particular thing, especially talking about S3, where you know it's something with a ton of use um, and a lot of uh, specific, you know varied use cases that all kind of come down to uh, you know different ways that people want to handle things. Um, that, uh, but just as a kind of a, a, a summary from there is that um, depending on your organizational needs, in-house versus some minor provider, um, like in-house is a perfectly legitimate solution, something to, uh, that especially for a lot of people is going to be relatively cost effective, especially if you're just trying to cold store something. But this isn't something that should need a ton of maintenance. Sure. So Mark, you can follow up on Slack. We have started a thread there in the Kiosk Carnival 2022 channel. And I think uh, Jake or Emily will be glad to take your question. So I'll get to the next one. Uh, so I left a comment in the chat about this as well, but I can expand on it a little bit. Um, basically, it's uh, it's all of maturity curves. Uh, as you start um, kind of thinking about, OK, we have very robust incident re uh, response protocols. We're very confident with everything we can do in our scope of imagination, then naturally you start worrying about, um, okay, but what are the things we're not imagining yet? And that's when we start talking about these solutions that involve multi-cloud setups or redundant third-party tools, um, your backups of backups and things like this. Um, but we don't think it's something that it's like, oh, um, only enterprise level companies should be thinking about this. Um, because the sooner you start looking at your long-term plans, the sooner you start thinking about the benefits of it, even if it's not something you can afford at the time, the more prepared you will be in those situations where uh, suddenly you're scrambling to come up with any sort of line of defense against these hypothetical meteors. Um, so I think it's always worth thinking about. It's always worth looking in. OK, if we had the resources, what would we do to make ourselves even more uh, resilient? Um, but of course, uh, a robustness, uh, preparing for the, the outages and such you know about um, should always kind of come first. Yeah, and to expand on this a little bit more too, is that uh, this this is something that can start with even just like a one hour meeting with your teammates um, and just kind of brainstorming what kind of stuff could happen, could be problems for us, um, or could be things that may, you know, test the limits of what our system can do. Um, or maybe it ends up being a, uh, um, you know, and a full afternoon type of thing, or, you know, uh, whatever scale kind of makes sense for being able to discuss it at whatever level your organization wants to. But it isn't necessarily even about um, being able to have that capacity or ever have the capacity of saying, hey, you know, we can do all of this totally resilient, awesome, uh, you know, recovery type stuff. Um, but by knowing what kind of stuff you might even want to be able to have, like uh, infrastructure as code, for example, is a great way to be able to handle like, a malicious employee decides to take down everything that you have. Well, if you have it as infrastructure as code, it can come back up pretty quickly and you may be able to restore your systems a lot more quickly than if you have a whole bunch of things that are, you know, finely tuned or whatever. Um, but just by knowing the fact is like, oh, hey, we should be getting everything onto Terraform or whatever infrastructure as code tool that we use. Um, that by guiding that direction even now is that you can end up in a place where you can get those robust features or that, you know, that resiliency later on. Um, so, you know, it's baby steps the entire way is that, you know, is uh, where premature optimization is not something uh, that most companies can afford either. Is that, you know, you get something out the door and then you're paying off technical debt a lot of the time. And the same thing's true with kind of what we do for backup practices and resiliency practices as well. Is that it's like when we've got time and once we suddenly have a reason to care about it. Okay, I think that answers it. So we've already run out of time here. So I think I'm going to have to end this session. Uh, thank you, Jake. Thank you, Emily, for joining in. It was a great talk. And I'm really glad that you took the time to answer the questions and actually be here. And thank you, people, for joining in. It was a great session. I'm sure you enjoyed a lot. So we'll end here. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us.